In Revelation 12 and verse 11, it says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, uh, and they did not love their lives to the death. To, to give a testimony uh, in church is, is not something that is unique. I mean, it's something that has been going on for a long, long time. And I, I think it helps us, you know, in a lot of different ways because we can associate with one another, and sometimes we can't, <laughs> but we look at each other from different, from different backgrounds. And so I want to share my testimony with you this morning and um, things that happened to me and how I came to the Lord. But uh, ever since I was a, a small child, I, I wanted to be a criminal. That was my goal because my father was a criminal. He, he wasn't in the mafia, but he was connected, uh, and he, he uh, owned jute boxes and pool tables and shuffle boards across the north side of Chicago. Uh, but, you know, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. I should go back. Um, he was the, the son of a sharecropper in uh, Tennessee. And I was born in a place called Tiptonville. <laughs> what a name! Huh? I was born in Tiptonville, Tennessee, and and he and, and Dad he came to Chicago to make more money, you know, as everybody did back in the early fifties, you know. And um, he was a fighter. He um, fought a lot, and um, he got a job as a bouncer for a guy named Chuck Kincaid. And he worked for Chuck, and he built a reputation on the North Side. And uh, he saved his money, and he got a, a, a tavern, and then he got another tavern, and another one, and another one. And I guess he owned anywhere from eight to ten taverns, uh, one one nightclub I'd call a nightclub. And but there was one place called the uh, the Golden Goose, and um, the Golden Goose was a place. It was down in a basement, and uh, it was a place for people when they got out of prison to come and find out what was the latest con, what was the latest uh, criminal acts that you could engage in, you know, and, and, and make money. And uh, I kind of, you know, I went there all the time when I was a kid, uh, cleaned up late at night um, when I was young. Um, and uh, my, I can remember the first thing that my dad uh, uh, did when I was little as he put me on a bar stool he said come here and then he let me fall to the ground and he said now nah, don't you trust anybody uh, and so I didn't uh, and um, uh, you know the, the people that were there there were some that were very dangerous and then there were some that I really liked a lot that worked on worked with me you know and helped me come along um, uh, just thinking of some of the people I, I think about uh, Jake Cohen Jake was a Jewish guy. He looked a little bit like um, uh, who's that? David Copperfield, the uh, you know. The, and Jake could climb up uh, a, a building, the side of a building, just going through the the holes in the bricks, you know, and the lines in the brick. And he would uh, rob people, and he liked to do it while they were home. Uh, I know of one person he killed uh, doing it, and uh, he was a stone cold murderer. Um, uh, Jake, um, they had told me to stay away from him. And Jake, uh, two cop, two detectives came in one day and he killed them both right on the spot. And they chased him to Michigan and there um, he took some hostages and, and finally ended up uh, killing uh, killing him, you know, shooting, shooting him to death. There was John Henry. John Henry was a murderer for hire. Uh, and um, uh, I went to his murder trial. Uh, and then there was a guy named Don Gibson. Now, Don was a good guy. I mean, I, I really liked Don. He was a really big guy, wide up at top, narrow, and the hips had curly blonde hair, a scar there. He had a couple of girls working for him, and uh, I remember the first time he took me with him as a kid, I was just enjoyed it, you know, so much. You know, we went we went to his house, and, and all of his clothes were out on the, on the lawn. <laughs> his wife had thrown everything out. <laughs> and he was just so well. I'm in trouble again, you know. And just and he kicked him right out of the house. And and uh, I remember going out with him. He had a Cadillac, and and he'd send the girls in, and they were boosters, and they were they were really good thieves. And uh, um, I went in, and they said, "I want you to hold the door because we, there's a couple of boxes over there. We're going to get them out." So they grabbed the boxes. I held the door. We ran and jumped in the Cadillac, took off, and driving and he he the cops were after us and he got away from him and 
And uh, he parked. He said, okay, let's see what it is. And it was ch- shirt stuffers. <laughs> you know, they got things he stuffed his shirt with. And, and he got so mad, he, he slapped him around a little bit. But it, w- it was crazy. Um, and they were slick, and, and slick ran around with me some. But slick was kind of a mean guy. Uh, one time he said he was going out, and his wife told him no, and he took her out on the on the porch and put her arm on the step and broke it uh, just because she said he couldn't go. He was a bad guy, but, you know, he liked me a lot, and I'm glad I didn't listen to him because he wanted to uh, rob a, um armored car by, you know, putting some dynamite and in, 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 in putting a, uh, a, a magnet on it and then driving by the door of the, th- of the thing and flipping it on there, you know, so it sticks and blowing the door up. And Anyway, uh, Slick, uh, I don't know what's happened to him. I haven't heard a word about him. But those are the kind of people that uh, I grew up around. They would be in there all day. There was a phone booth in the tavern, and uh, it was called the Golden Goose. It was really, really a, a rough place. Uh, when I was very young, uh, my dad used to beat my mother. And um, what I did, and my mother told me this, I didn't really remember a lot about it, but I told him, and I wasn't, couldn't have been more than eight, and I said, if you ever hit her again, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to murder you. And uh, he didn't want to sleep with one eye open, <laughs> I guess. So he stopped beating her, is what she said, and I was very happy about that. But anyway, uh, um, I grew up like that, and, and when I uh, was about 11, of course, that lifestyle, my parents divorced. Uh, my mother remarried again. The guy was an alcoholic, and uh, uh, we, they, we moved to a little suburb outside of Chicago, Wonder Lake, and I thought things were going to really be good there, but uh, they weren't. He hated my guts, and, you know, you're just going to have to go maybe live with your father. But he didn't want me, you know, and he was living with women, different women and stuff. And so, really, I, I was on my own for about a year and a half, or maybe almost two on the street. So I was a street kid. I grew up on the street there and uh, until I got word from my mother that uh, they had no food, no heat, no, you know, no electricity. And so I went back to Wonder Lake and got her and my sisters and brothers, and, and we had a little apartment that uh, that was uh, part of an old house, and it was black soot on the walls, and um, uh, there was bugs and there was rats. It was one bedroom, and uh, she slept in the living room with a bed there, and um, she gave birth to my youngest sister there at home. Uh, on the kitchen table and uh, uh, anyway uh, you know I was kind of messed up to say the least you know and so I was a pretty bad guy kid teenager and and you wouldn't want to meet me because when I looked at you the first thing I would say is how can I take what you have you know you've got something that I could get and how, what, how far do I have to go to get it? And I would do whatever I had to do to get whatever you had. And I, and I grew up, but, you know, it was the 60s, you know, and, I mean, I was totally free. Nobody told me what to do or anything like that. And I, I, I drove around with the guys, and uh, we had kind of a gang uh, uh, and got in a lot of fights, and, and we spent most of our time robbing. Uh, places uh, like uh, drugstore, the movie theater, and, uh, uh, gar- uh, tire store, and, uh, just all kinds of different places. And then um, uh, I got caught, and and I was standing before Judge Selinsky, and my father found out, and he. Got a, got to the police because the police were so corrupt back then. Oh, you couldn't imagine how corrupt they were. We paid them off, and in in the tavern, if somebody got killed, they just made sure they weren't found in the tavern. They they took them out to the alley. Uh, and it was just a really corrupt deal. And so anyway, <clears throat> uh, Judge Shalinsky said, "Well, where's the store owner?" Because they they got to him, and we don't know. You know, and he says, "Where's the police?" Well, we don't know. You know. And the Judge Selinsky looked at me, and he said, uh, you know, he says, you're getting out of this this time. He said, but I'm going to send you away. 
And he says, the next time I see you, you're going to prison. And uh, I was already on the dockets for another deal where a guy hit me. I hit a guy with the car and and then beat him up and, um, uh, you know, his uh, son. Uh, but anyway, so I lied about my age, and I went to uh, the Navy. And uh, I was there in the Navy, you know, that I continued doing the same thing. I conned my, my uh, chief and everybody, and I had no work. I was on this huge floating city, and I you know, sold drugs there and, uh, uh, you know, and did whatever I needed to do. Uh, and then when I got out of the Navy, I went to work for Dad. Uh, now, Dad was connected with the, the, the mob through the jukebox, box, pool table, shuffleboard business, and he had a territory cut out. But the problem was that uh, uh, he was a compulsive gambler. Um, the, 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 the mob fixed one race uh, at, uh, at one race every time they went to race, okay? There was one race out of the 10 or 11 that was fixed. Well, they would give Dad the horse right before he would go, you know, right a few seconds so it wouldn't drive up the odds. And I would go with him and one of one of his goons, and we would stand there, and he, they were in the clubhouse, and he'd go and he'd flash us the number of the horse, and we would jump the stands and run, and, and we'd get there, and, and we'd see. Sometimes we'd make it, sometimes we wouldn't. But the thing is, he couldn't stop gambling, you know. I mean, it wasn't about that one race anymore. It was about all the races. So he lost all his money, and, um, um, and he got shot, and... Um, Big Carl took over his uh, his, his territory, you know, and, and it was a rough time. Uh, now, all this time, I had Sylvia. She was the only person in my whole life I ever trusted. I never trusted anybody else. And I met her at uh, an all, well, before or after, before. but a little bit before uh, I schoolyard. met in a schoolyard. Yeah, I met her, and I was only like 14 and uh, uh, she, I told her I was 18. She believed me. So, you know. you like <laughs> and I did not look my age. I mean, I grew up at 12. That's, But anyway, uh, she went to an all-girls Catholic school. Her parents were from the old country, you know, so they were very moral. And She had to go in at 8 o'clock at night, which gave me lots of free time. And um, uh, it was a great, uh, a great deal. And, but we had our first child. You know, I got married when I was in this in the Navy, and uh, my dad and Slick were our my my best man. And then for the honeymoon, I went to the racetrack. But anyway, uh, we uh, after he you know after he lost his territory, I was working at a nightclub called the the uh, um, I don't know, losing my, my nightfall. nightfall, yeah. And he burned it to the ground in half a block with it uh, for the insurance money. And so I was at home, and I, I saw that, you know, on TV. And I said, oh, that's great, you know. And um, anyway, we had our first baby, and I'm looking at my child, and I'm looking out on the street. We were up on the third floor. and I'm thinking, you know, I, I just don't want to raise my child the way I was raised. I don't want her... To experience any of this stuff, and so we moved to a foreign country. We moved to Oklahoma. You know, <laughs> it was definitely a foreign country. The first time I walked in and and was in the bathroom, they were scripture written on the bathroom wall, and I said, "What kind of planet is this?" You know, I didn't I didn't understand it. I remember going to the grocery store, and they used to carry your groceries out there in Oklahoma. And so I'm checking out, and this this kid grabs my my grocery cart, and I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to take your groceries and load them in the car. I said, sure you are. You better get your hands off my groceries right now, buddy, you know, and, and it was like, you know, I had no idea. They waved at us. I always thought they were giving up, giving me the, us the bird, you know, or something, you know, because they'd raise their hands up or they'd go like this or whatever. I thought that was some kind of Oklahoma bird, you know, 
And uh, <laughs> I found out it was just that they would wave at people. I told her, I said, they wave at you here. And she goes, well, I'm not waving at anybody. I don't know. You know, it was like, it was really a, a foreign country to me uh, to be in. Um, well, I was still stealing, uh, still figured out a way to rob, rob from my company, had a restaurant, got a restaurant with my sister. And uh, I started looking. You know, I I started thinking, you know, there's something more to life. You know, there's got to be something better somewhere out there. So I started looking around, and uh, um, I I remembered my grandmother, and she had uh, had gone to the Church of Christ, and she was. I mean, I went to a lot of churches, Catholic. I went to. We went to Pentecostal churches all over, just starting to look, you know, see what I could find. And and um, then I called Grandmother up. I said, Grandmother, I, I, I'm reading this, this Bible, and I said, I don't understand a word of it. I said, it doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. And so um, she said, well, I can't explain it to you, but I'll have somebody there that can. And um, she came over with this, this guy from the Eastside Church of Christ, and he never preached a sermon in his life, but he was a, a real soul-winning guy, a teacher of the lost. And he came in, and he had a really calm attitude. And we went through the Jewel Miller film strips. And later on in life, I got to meet Jewel and became friends with him. And on the fifth film strip, they show you this, uh, this the gospel, you know, and it gives you a chance to respond to it. And I remember at that point, I thought to myself, man, I have been lied to my whole life, you know. And I have a Father in heaven that loves me and that will stick with me that I can trust, you know. And so I was baptized that night. My, now, my... My wife is a little heather, and she waited three weeks after that to to be baptized. <laughs> uh, no, she was she was Roman Catholic, and we took a little more study with her, and uh, and we became Christians. And uh, I thought I was so naive. I thought everybody in the world is going to want this message. This is the greatest thing I've ever heard. You know, I'm, you, you can, what a deal, you know. You can give Christ your life and get all your sins forgiven. Everything you've ever done wiped away. And I thought, man, this is great. And I started having Bible studies. We had them one after the other. At least two nights a week we were showing film strips in our house. It was talking to people everywhere. And we were going to that church, and then I had a class about uh, – waiting on the table and they wanted us to do a little talk so I got up and did a talk and the elders came to me and they said uh, listen if you we think you've got the ability to be a preacher if you I said me <laughs> you don't know me I'm not, a, I'm not a preacher and they said but if you go to school we'll give you some money to support you so with their support and my VA benefits uh, I went to the Bear Valley School of Biblical Studies, went back to school, uh, graduated from uh, Bear Valley, went extension, extended uh, studies in, in evangelism and missions. Well, uh, in the meantime, uh, I walked over to my sister's house before I w went to preaching school, and she was crying, and she had a newspaper, and she threw it down, and it was Dad's picture on the paper. I just knew he was dead. I knew he was dead, but he wasn't. Uh, he got arrested for for uh, doing a, a firebomb on the off track, an off track betting facility, which was connected with uh, with the mob there. They were they were cutting into their business, and so Dad uh, blew up the place for them. And he got busted, and, he, and if they, he told me, you know, always that if had there been so much publicity, he would have gotten off. But he went to prison. He went to uh, Joliet, uh, and then he paid off a guy who ran for mayor not that long ago in uh, uh, Chicago and got him out of Joliet, and he went to Marion, 
which is where, uh, uh, you know, it was a lot better facility, you know. And he, he was there. And anyway, I remember calling him when I became, uh, was about to become a preacher. I said, Dad, I'm going to become a preacher. And he said, uh, oh, man, that's, gr- that's great. We can make some money with that, you know. I said, no, Dad, you don't understand. You know, this is this is real, you know, and he... He he couldn't understand it. Slick was there with him, and he said, Slick got on the phone and said, well, man, I've done a lot of things with you. He says, uh, I'll go to church if you want to, <laughs> if you want me to. <laughs> but anyway, um, a lot of things happened, and um, during the time that I was just about ready to graduate, we went to Chicago to, to see him, and um, um, some of my folks there, and and we went and visited the church that brought us some food over when we when we needed uh we needed some food and when we were living in Chicago in that little real rough area and and I went in and there was twelve people in in the church and after it was over, I did a lesson for him. He came to me and he said one of the guys that was kind of in charge and he said uh we uh we are about to close the doors. We don't have enough money to keep it open and anything like that. I said, well, could you pay a preacher? And they said, well, we can give you $50 a month. And I said, talk to Sylvia. They had a place right there in that get next to the church. It was a really bad area back then. Now it's ho- the whole thing has changed, but it was really bad then. And they said, we'll fix it up for you. The ceiling was in the roof was in the floor so we went out and I raised the money and I, I raised enough money for a salary and uh, we started I started preaching there and I preached in that Chicago church for five years um, and uh, we grew to about uh, two to 40 maybe somewhere in that area we had elders deacons and the church was doing uh, self-supporting Okay, we went from non-self-supporting to self-supporting, which was really great. The Lord blessed us so much there. And it was tough. Uh, there's things like stories I could tell you that, you know, that it would take up all the time. It was just unbelievable. Uh, we had we used to have Helen that went to church there. And, and Helen was, uh, we called her the bug lady because she'd be talking to you and she had a, a wig on. And a roach might crawl out of her wig and down her face and go down into her dress. And, and uh, we we were the only church around that had a, a youth ministry of killing bugs, you know, because they would sit, the youth would sit around her and stomp the bugs when they would ro- come off of her, you know. And it was like, uh, it was funny though, you know. I remember one time uh, she came to me, and they all called me Brother John. She says, Brother John, because I had preached on homosexuality and that God loves the homosexual, but, uh, you know, this, it's the sin. And she goes, Brother John, she says, don't you, don't you think it's better for him to have sex at home than anywhere else? And I said, yeah, sister, <laughs> when you put it that way, I think you're absolutely right. So she wasn't playing with, a, a, you know, a level dipstick, I, you know. But... Anyway, it was quite a place. We had uh, we got Bible call, which we had set up in the church, and I had a, a hotline. They call in and get a message, you know, about the Bible. And I had a hotline to my house there, which um, um, I would get calls maybe twenty four hours sometimes at any time. Uh, people, girls being raped. I remember one woman, girl that was raped, and I asked her who raped her, and she said uh, my my um, uh, brother-in-law and I said well is he gonna rape you again and she said yes and I said well you better tell the family well she called me back up when she told the family they kicked her out so you know uh, you know you can't win it was a rough it, you know there's so many stories but anyway uh, Sills folks lived in Europe and uh, in Austria uh, her father's an artist and um, uh, her father is from Hungary, and Hungary, of course, is behind the Iron Curtain. And there was a big, a famous guy named Otis Gatewood. I don't know if you've ever heard that name, but he was a missionary 
um, and he was taking Bibles behind the Iron Curtain, but he had too many uh, stamps on his deal. He couldn't get visa. Yeah, he couldn't get back in there, and he had no reason to go in there. Well, with her connection, family connection there, I had a reason to go behind the curtain. So uh, what I did is Sylvan and I decided to leave Chicago, and I went out and raised support again, and uh, we went overseas and uh, set ourselves up in Dietachdorf, Austria. Um, and then I would take Bibles and run Bibles through uh, across the Iron Curtain uh, into Hungary. We'd have classes, and they would be, you know, people would cry just to get a hold of a Bible because they were all taken away by the, the communist. And uh, anyway, um, you know, somebody said, well, it wasn't that da- it was not as dangerous as any street in, she- in the, north, the place where I grew up. So, But I did get caught once. It was kind of different because... Uh, Sil's father speaks, what, five languages, I think, and uh, he spoke Russian and, and Croatian, and they're very similar. And so he would take, uh, he was Roman Catholic, and he would take a bottle of booze with him, and he would give it to him at the border and to let us to let him go through. So I just, I just, I didn't have any part with that, but I just kind of went along, you know, and and I had these Bibles hid. They were under the under the back of the car and uh, uh, in the trunk, back of the trunk, and under the dash. And so he says to me, you know, he says, "Listen, if you we ever get caught, he says, let me do the talking." I said, "Okay, okay." So we come up, and there's a whole new group of guys there, and they don't know him. And we pull up, and they got their machine guns and all this stuff, and and they said. Uh, uh, where, uh, you know, where are you going? And I told him, and then the captain comes out, and the captain sees me right away. He knows that I'm not uh, Austrian. You know, he, he knows I'm American. They can shoot it. They can see an American anywhere in the world. So he tells me to go to the back. I go to the back of their house. You know, the machine gun place there that they had, and he starts going through the back of the car. And then he feels down, and he goes up, and he pulls up, 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 uh, up the thing. And he says, what do we have here? You know, first he says, uh, what sends he from Baruch, or what do you do for a living? You know, which uh, I say priesta, because they don't understand preacher in that part of the world. And he says, what do you have here? And I looked up at my my father-in-law and he go he looks at me and says what have you got here <laughs> so he he threw me under the bus you know oh. <laughs> but that's okay because the the guard uh slowly put it down and he says uh elabe in jesus i believe in jesus he said mm-hmm. and so he put the, the thing back on and um um Anyway, there's so many stories that I could tell about all that stuff, and I, I don't want to go too long. But um, Reagan devaluated the dollar, you know, and so we couldn't stay there because uh, I had enough support before that, but it went down by 50%. And if you don't pay your bills there, I mean, they, they won't mess with you. They'll put you in jail. And so we came back to the States, and I looked for the first church that um, I could find. I tried out with kind of what I call a preacher parade. <laughs> they had 12 guys speak, okay, and, and I was one of those 12, and we, we got the job. And and then again, I went to another foreign country, and um, um, I stayed there for eight years, and it was a good eight years. But then, um, you know, small-town politics can be what they are. And um, there was a guy who had everybody in his hip pocket because he he wrote the loans for that area at the local, uh, I won't say because this is being recorded, but he got into it and expected me to be on his side, and I wasn't because I thought he was wrong. And anyway, one thing led to another to another. And, and so uh, during that time, I had 
uh, gone into the prison ministry. And in the prison ministry is the Clements uh, Maximum Security Prison for five years while I was preaching up there. And I was working with guys that were murderers um, and talking with them and, you know, trying to counsel with them and stuff. And it was during that time I met a guy in that ministry who had a, a kennel, uh, and it had a house on it. So he let us just take over the payments. And so we just moved into that kennel, and uh, we, we had as many as 83 dogs in there at once. It was quite a deal, uh, Willow Creek Kennels. And uh, um, we had a house there. And during that time, uh, an elderly gentleman came to me that was at the church that I was preaching at. And it was funny how I met him because he hadn't been to church in a lot of years. His wife had a stroke, and he was taking care of us, care of her, and he was a very angry type guy. And I knocked on the door one day to visit his wife, and he said, what do you want? I said, I'm here to visit your wife. He said, we don't want any of it. We don't want to hear it. And I said, well, I'm not here to visit you, so you can get out of the way. I'm here to visit your wife. He said, hmm, and he stepped out of the way, and I came in and studied with her, you know, while she was an invalid. And during the course of the study, this guy who had never hadn't been to church in I don't know how many years, he came to church, okay? And the whole community was really just kind of, wow, you know, this guy's coming. Because he used to own a store, and everybody knew him. He was kind of a mean guy, you know. And anyway, um, he came to the kennel one day as I was looking for another preaching job, and uh, it just, I don't know, you know, what was going on with me then. But um, he said, you know, I don't like how they treated you there. And he wrote me a check for $24,000, and he gave it to me. And I said, are you sure you want to give me this money? He goes, yes, I do, because he says, I want to help you. I know you, you don't have a retirement or nothing. And so I used that money to go back to school. And I went to school, and first I got an insurance license, and I studied and passed all those tests, and then I got a annuity license and passed all that and then I got a securities license and and passed that and I became a a financial advisor Um, but I also was an associate preacher with uh, a black African American congregation in uh, Pampa Um, and it was the uh, Oklahoma Street Church of Christ great church, I met him when I was doing gospel meetings when I was a preaching and uh, I I preached there and I worked as the financial advisor and then from there I went on to uh, become a a senior VP of a money management company that uh, offers uh, uh, strategies and and, uh, strategists to uh, stock market uh, you know strategies that advisors can use with their clients so that takes us about to uh, run out, running out of time. But, um, you know, so many things have happened. I mean, that you, it makes you just, you know, wonder how, how God works, you know, in your life. And, and even times when I should be, I should be dead, and I'm not. You know, I'm, I'm here. So I made it to, I never thought I'd make it to 18, but I made it to 18. I never thought I'd make it to 21, but I made it to 21. So all of this is just gravy, you know. And I'm just uh, happy to be alive, and I'm happy to get my head on straight now and uh, serve the Lord and, and do whatever I can for him. So uh, I appreciate you listening to my uh, testimony.